So what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly introduce uh, the market space livelihoods main themes within the broader EJ strategy. And then I'm going to talk about uh, GEM, uh, which I think most of the people in the room know. So I'm only going to go over it quickly. And I'm going to give as non-technical a description as possible, um, more for the people who are somewhat new to it or not as familiar with some of the details. And Hugo will go over uh, the EDP aspects. What I'm going to kick off with is uh, three short slides on a simple and a short a description of GEM as, as, as I could possibly make. Um, I'm going to explain here, I'm just saying what we're trying to do. And it's, it might be difficult to read it at the back, so I'll read it out. And I just wanted to remind people kind of what are some of the key terms when we're talking about market-based livelihoods programs. So it's livelihoods that increase women's economic leadership, food security, and employment. So a lot of these terms came back this morning uh, in the presentations. Launching sustainable enterprises. That's something that's, come, that's uh, very much in GEM, but obviously EDP very much leads on that, on the nitty gritty in the day to day. Advocating for broader change in market systems and achieving scale of impact. I think these are things that you're familiar with yourselves, um, but has been reinforced today as something that we really want to do to a national level, to take best practice examples, showcase them how they can be replicated, how they can be leveraged to a broader level, and how advocacy can be done effectively. And think about long-term program development that incorporates risk analysis, including climate change. And this is something which is key and inherent in any type of commercial endeavor. When you're thinking about, if I want this to be a product that works not just for local communities, but also for informal or formal markets, it's something that has to have a demand over a medium to long term and has to guarantee a certain amount of supply. So even if we're not talking about you know, large case, large exports or very formal um, and high quality and uh, uh, high quality standards of product, we still need to think about what the market demand is for those types of products. So what are we trying to do to get there? And uh, I've written these up um, and they're basically it's what we're trying to do and really push forward this week. Building coordinated and decentralized support structures. For those especially in GEM, I think you're familiar with the term as I've been talking about it a lot over the last year, is to really emphasize that for the scale that we want to do this as an organization, it can't obviously just be a few people in Oxfam House or one or two. And it, that would be uh, uh, pointless anyway because a lot of you are already working on this. It's really just re-emphasizing that we have a very strong network here at both regional and global levels, and that's something that we're really looking to reinforce and push forward. Building staff and partners' capacity and skills in agribusiness, collaboration in multidisciplinary teams, facilitation of multi-stakeholder spaces. All that is really trying to say is just that we be, uh, need to become as comfortable as we are talking with our peers within our own specialization as talking to our peers across different specializations. Now, I can't say that I'm an adaptation and risk reduction specialist, but I've become comfortable talking to Daniel and to others in the, in the different regions and learning about what that means and what type of impact that has, uh, both um, at a broader policy level but also at a technical level. And that just comes through having those discussions with people. It doesn't need to take up you know, uh, all of your time. You don't, it doesn't mean you have to get a PhD in it. It just means that you need to recognize the multidimensional nature of what those barriers to poverty are for small-scale farmers. Developing the right tools and accountability. Well, the tools we've been uh, uh, talking about um, for a long, long time um, a lot of them appear in the toolkit, the GEM toolkit that, that most of you have heard about, and they're ones that we want to continue to develop. Accountability is something that is much uh, your as my responsibility to think about the monitoring and evaluation and learning, and how do we prove that, we're, that what we're trying to do is actually working. And finally, promoting communities of practice to disseminate knowledge and learning. So I've been to two re events recently that were both uh, as impressive as they were educational. One was in uh, Latin America called the Sustainable Livelihoods Learning Network, and the other uh, actually by coincidence just a week and a half later in Sri Lanka on the Community of Practice on Women's Economic Leadership. 
and both really showed a rich variety of experience, but also exchange of knowledge between uh, regional uh, colleagues and partners, some of which are here in the room. And it's something that really impressed me and made me realize very much that from a global perspective, um, if we want to get the best out of our work, all I'm looking to do is to make sure that that knowledge goes beyond the regions, but that we capture that knowledge from the countries and we make that a, a useful case studies, experiences, and promotion of, of lessons learned, not just within the region, but across regions as well. So I'm also just going to say oversimplifying, but just to kind of answer this question once and for all, what the complementarity is between EDP and GEM. And knowing that what we talked about this morning about these three rural worlds, I wanted to just give a very simple graph um, in, very, in many respects oversimplifying, but just to talk about um, uh, assets and where we're targeting people with different amounts of assets. So if you imagine, as you heard this morning about the different rural worlds, that people in the lower part in rural world, I'm sorry, I got this mixed up. This is actually supposed to be three, and that's one. But imagine this is rural world one with people with a very low asset base. And a low asset base could be anything from skills, machinery, market information, knowledge, access to land, uh, formal and informal types of mechanisms to establishing themselves, guaranteeing food security, and, and improving their, their livelihoods. And imagine that would build over time to a group or uh, an individual or community that would have a larger asset base towards the end of it. So if we're thinking about that type of group, then EDP sits very much within the, the rural world too. Now again, I said I'm oversimplifying this because I'm sure a lot of, or some of the EDP group here would disagree and say, well actually, and Armenia is a case in point actually, the program they're starting up, they're actually working with landless uh, women, so you could say within a lower asset base in the, in the rural world one, uh, rural world three, sorry. Um, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is that we're predominantly focusing on that group with some asset base and who are looking to become connected to or more connected to markets so they can establish a, a, a greater and more sustainable source of income. And that this group is, as, and as, as Joe's pointed out, and it's an open question for us still, is how do we also target better those groups? Now that's what GEM is also trying to do more, is very much think about how when you're working at best practice at the local level and you're thinking about direct interventions, how does the advocacy, the leveraging, and the replication of your projects and pushing that to other actors within your countries, within the private sector, within the public sector, so how can best policy, uh, better policies be, be developed to ensure that the operating environment for small-scale farming can benefit more than just the target communities that we're thinking about in our specific projects? And that's thinking about you know, pushing more into this rural world, thinking more about land, asset rights. Um, another great example uh, is from uh, Colombia, actually. Uh, of the, uh, I'll talk about that later in more detail. But, They've, they've, they really helped push with, this, with, a, with the EDP project for a greater um, a, um, access to credit for landless uh, smallholder farmers. This is the other one to complement that slide. This is talking about the market map. And for those, I, I can't imagine there's anyone in the room who isn't familiar with this. But basically what it's trying to capture is the value chain, the services that support that value chain, and the broader operating environment, or dis disenabling and enabling environment, which also has an impact on that value chain. EDP sits in the space of, from production to enterprise, anything up to the processor. And it might go a little bit further. Obviously, it is, it is thinking about the consumer. Where is the market for that? But that's the primary, primary source, uh, the focus of the, of the program work on a day-to-day -day basis. GEM is very explicitly thinking about and emphasizing to make sure that there is a, a, a to think about that there is a market for these products um, when, when establishing a program with uh, rural communities. But it's also obviously thinking more broadly about targeting where the uh, major issues are in the services environment and also in the disenabling enabling environment. 
So it's very much a holistic approach, thinking more broadly about where can, uh, where can we best intervene in the entire market system, not just at the base of the chain, or indeed not just in the value chain, but beyond that as well. Um, these are examples of the types of questions um, that, uh, that the two pro uh, programs would ask. And it's just to illustrate that they're very complementary programs, but I think I've made that point. So now I'm going to talk about GEM specifically. So as I said, I'm going to give a very brief summary, and then I'm going to talk about it in a bit more detail. So in, in, in the shortest way possible, you could say GEM builds on the experience, success, and interest from around the world. And here's a couple of examples, by no means exhaustive, of the types of programs that, uh, that spring to some of our minds when we're thinking about um, what's been building towards GEM. and responds to the high country office demand for markets-based livelihoods approaches. This is a, this is a graph um, that we put together uh, of the analysis of JCAS from the last, from the 2011. So when all the JCASs were reviewed, we did a kind of keyword search of what their higher priorities were. And this is, by the way, a conservative estimate, otherwise it would have gone up slightly higher as well into the 80-90%. What this is showing is that if you were to add up all of the countries that have at least a 50% overlap with their key priority strategies for the next coming years, with what GEM as a framework is trying to do, you've got you know, 9, 15, you've got uh, almost 30 countries which are, uh, which are uh, interested in looking to work on these types of things. And interestingly, not all of those 30 countries are actually the countries that have uh, submitted GEM concept notes. And on top of that, there are also others which have more in, uh, interest in some areas of, of it as well. If you were to add in the 40-50%, that's another 13 countries. So again, this is to emphasize that this is not a type of program that can be managed from one single uh, place in the world. It's something that has to be supported at the regional le uh, uh, level and obviously has to be at some point very much country-led. And finally, um, it's to support those small-scale farmers' livelihoods where Oxfam can have the greatest impact, but realistically also where donors are engaged. So we're a global organization. We work in multiple countries across the world. Um, but we are talking to a lot of donors as well to say, here's where we feel we should be working. Here's our priority, but also understanding where their priorities are as well. These, by the way, are the ones that, that, from a GEM perspective, we've been talking to a lot. And we'll talk about that uh, in more detail later on this week. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a bit about the history of, of GEM, just to kind of reemphasize that you know, this, is, this is something that's been building over time. And for some of you, some aspects may seem new. And for others, it's really not a surprise at all. It's maybe just a pleasant surprise that it's, that it's been put together in one framework. So this is a timeline from 2004 to 2013. And uh, the way I've broken it down very roughly is country projects, initiative strategies and programs, and workshops and tools. And when I run this, all it really is, is showing is that there's a number of programs and projects and ideas and innovations and workshops just like this one where ideas circulate amongst themselves. There's not from what I've understood, there's never been one leading process that's been pushing this. It's happened relatively organically, and we've pulled ideas together to really recognize that a holistic approach is what's necessary. So back in 2004, we had power markets as a concept. In the meantime, there was the Sri Lankan tsunami. There was a huge humanitarian response. A few years later, you had a recall in Bangladesh that Noral just spoke about. EDP began as a program in 2008. Well began just before that with Women's Collective Action, although it's been running for years, but it was a program. The Sustainable Livelihoods Learning Networks began in Latin America. The Asian Community of Practices began. Sri Lanka changed, actually, with Steve's help, who's here in the room, moving from a humanitarian to a program approach, focusing on Coir in the southern province. Uh, other types of events took place, like the new business models and private sector engagement. Philippines Moringa is a, 
good case in point of learning to uh, deal with adaptation and risk reduction as well as contracting with different partners. The new business models in Ethiopia and Tanzania are two great case studies of uh, setting up uh, alternative business strategies with uh, farmers in respectively Sisal, which uh, Ralph from Tanzania can speak to in much more detail than I can and coffee in Ethiopia with a side in, in honey working engaging women's groups, which both Mulu and Shekar, who, who's now the Mises Regional Livelihoods Lead, but, but led on that program for many years in Ethiopia, can speak to also in much more detail. Now, as I said, also Alpina is a great example of a best case uh, uh, um, enterprise which uh, convinced the government um, to think uh, and to change their policy on providing credits to uh, smallholder farmers without land, which is a huge ch mindset change, uh, uh, as I understand it, having a background in microfinance, that one of the basic components of providing uh, uh, loans to smallholder farmers would be that they have, to have, uh, uh, they have to have land to underwrite that loan. So I am, I, I'm sure there are many other examples which I haven't captured on this slide. All I'm trying to emphasize is that there wasn't one program or one country project or one type of event that really kicked this off. It was a collective and organic process of learning and recognizing what the important components were to develop GEM. So the key areas being power in markets conceptually, women's economic leadership both conceptually and practically, and adaptation and risk reduction. And I circle EDP as well to really emphasize that it's a markets-based approach. It's focusing on something being demand-driven. What I'm going to do for GEM is I'm going to focus on these three areas. So GEM is this comprehensive approach um, which, cap tries to, which captures the power in markets, women's economic leadership, and adaptation and risk reduction. For those who wouldn't understand that, or, or I, must, I, I assume most people do, but if you have any more questions about that, I'll, I'm happy to go into more detail with you now, but I, I don't want to, to go over the technical details of that right now. All I'm going to summarize is to say that it's a, it's a holistic approach both thematically and it's a holistic approach both uh, strategically as well. And the strategy aspect is what we've been hearing more and more this morning and which some of you have been um, you know, seeing in your own projects as well as facilitating broader change in market systems. So really using that market map and leveraging to achieve scale of impact. So really thinking, using your, your, your um, specific projects and specific interventions to think about a broader based impact. And I won't go into, into this too much detail because it's terms that you already know, but obviously it's on food security, uh, both directly for rural communities and uh, indirectly for others living in poverty, empowering smallholder farmers and especially women through in increasing their income and increasing employment of smallholder, smallholder farmers and those without land or assets in the targeted communities. So also thinking about that third rural world and about labor employment. Thanks. So I'm going to have two more slides in which I go over and just re-emphasize what we've already done to date. What are the major achievements? One of the major achievements is the GEM Toolkit. I should add this is since 2011. This was also before my time. So this has been building for a while. But we recently basically completed and put online and put up videos, introductory and explanatory videos, about what the GEM Toolkit is. Now, it's definitely not a completely um, robust field-tested toolkit, but it's something that really gives a, a, a very robust guideline of the steps and how to put together your program design that really makes sure that you include the three major components of power markets, women's economic leadership, and adaptation and risk reduction. But it's something we absolutely want to get feedback on during this week and in the coming months as well. We also trained a number of people, um, had a number of workshops in five different places, totaling 75 staff and partners from 11 countries. So we've gotten, collected a lot of feedback over the last year on uh, what works in terms of the materials um, and what doesn't and how we can improve it. We've given feedback on 14 of the concept notes that have been submitted, which is, which is all of them, by the way. Um, we've developed a country assessment methodology. This is a methodology where, whereby you can um, uh, 
review your country staff to just see, and your partners as well, to see where it is that you, you could Im improve um, to manage um, GEM programs more, recognizing capacity. And finally, um, a GEM charter and board was agreed, which is to say, uh, I finally got this document out of the way, which I've been meaning to write, and, uh, and, and got it to a, a board of some senior managers. And we're now going to uh, make that board official um, in July when they have a first meeting. Uh, it, by the way, it's not people that you wouldn't know. It includes Olga, who's the RD in Mises. It includes um, uh, David, uh, who... Um, so I hope you want to be on the, on the board, David. Is that all right? Great. David's on the board. Uh, Steve as well. Um, and a couple of other people, um, as well as also uh, somebody from Oxfam Novib. What are we prioritizing, um, and really what are we making sure to kick off during this week for the coming year? As I said before, it's really that decentralized support structure led by regions and support, supported by global. All we're trying to really capture this week, and for me, which is the main area, is to really understand what it is that you want to do in your specific regions and how you think you're going to go about doing it and how we can help to make sure you can go about doing that in the countries that you want to do it in and be realistic about what, what the capacity is uh, within the countries and within your own staff and where we can really la uh, uh, focus to have the greatest impact or, or, or to prioritize um, and say what will we do first and what will we do second. Second, it's building communities of practice to promote peer learning and knowledge exchange. Three of the examples, I talked about all three of these just now. This is a photo from the community of practice in, on well in Sri Lanka. The other is the website of SLLN, the, uh, uh, the Latin America. Um, and the third is Grow, Sell, Thrive is a website that we've revamped, which has been around for a number of years. We have revamped under the, uh, the GEM uh, banner and which will be launching officially this week. <clears throat> We're also going to be doing a lot of donor fundraising support and program cost recovery. So it's really focusing on uh, uh, how we can best engage with donors. We already had a, have a couple of good examples of that, which I'll present to the GEM group this afternoon. But it's really to emphasize that we're obviously being realistic about you know, where, does, where does the financing come from. And finally, um, uh, which is more my responsibility obviously than yours, is to make sure that there's a board which um, recognizes the quality of what we're doing, that that information gets uh, spread to, other, to senior management organizationally, and that we're obviously uh, ensuring that our program quality uh, is maintained at a high standard. Why don't we take collective questions? But it is about uh, creating jobs and supporting um, uh, enterprises in poor communities. It's the next step after microfinance. People have talked about microfinance. How do we create enterprises that are a bit bigger, that can employ people, and that can create opportunities for, for, for poor communities and, and dynamize local economies, etc.? For the people outside Oxfam, uh, a lot of the things, what we present is we're trying to develop a model in EDP of how you set up viable businesses. And what's the combination, uh, as Penny was saying, of, of investment, loans and grants, capacity building advice, that will make those uh, rural enterprises succeed. So it's that combination of investment and, and capacity building that you know, we want to prove what combination makes enterprises su successful. Bringing the question back a bit to Oxfam as well, it's important that the sort of enterprises we try to support are mainly a smallholder enterprises. And the question we have for Oxfam is, how do you help all these remote, poor, marginalized smallholders, many of them women, connect to markets? And the answer we have is that we believe that you need some sort of specialized intermediaries. That's a, a, quest, uh, a name that David and maybe others uh, came together. These agents that will connect to many smallholder farmers and either trade their product or provide them with services. And these are the sort of animals that EDP is trying to prove which ones work and how do they work. And we have beautiful range of experience here.
from people that have gone for cooperatives, people that have gone for cooperatives of traders, individual people, individual entrepreneurs, medium-sized enterprises, all these different sort of business models that we'll talk about Tuesday afternoon that are playing the role of connecting poor, isolated uh, farmers to markets. This is the portfolio today. You'll have a gallery of all of these countries sitting in different corners and telling you their own story, so I won't go into that now. Um, can we move on? Uh, but I also want to say another thing that's interesting for uh, the Enterprise Development Program is, uh, again, as Penny was saying, is that recognizing that setting up enterprises is not easy, not in the UK or in, in developing countries. We sought to in, in involve people that have experience in, in, in these spaces. So we have set up a, a board with uh, people with a lot of experience in business and an investment committee as well, people who help us uh, make decisions on what enterprises to support and how. And we have, of course, a range of experts that we, we, we source and we, we work with locally as well. Fundraising, very briefly, but one of the key successes we could say of the program is that there's been uh, We've been managing to raise resources to support new projects every year. Uh, this afternoon, you'll have some people coming from the fundraising team. Uh, when they introduce themselves as fundraisers, I ask you, please give them a big hug and say thank you so much for prioritizing EDP as one of the things that Oxfam should be doing. And it's been a, a, a fantastic um, opportunity for fundraisers because they have something new to talk to donors and individual donors mainly about. Is Oxfam doing business and how your advice counts? It's been transformational for Oxfam's branding and fundraising as well. Uh, I won't go into this, but just a reminder briefly that um, part of the support that we give in the Enterprise Development Program is a loan, it's an investment, and that's new. Oxfam, there's a couple of odd cases that Alan can tell you a bit more, but basically this is the first attempt by Oxfam to give more than grants, investment, loans, and that's for a number of reasons. But one is to create a track record. People have had an ethical soft loan with Oxfam that will build their confidence and track record to go and get it from others. Some money will come back to Oxfam. We can do it yet again somewhere else. And, and then also it builds a sense of ownership. You know, we see that people, when the money is not on oh, another grant by Oxfam, you know, there's a higher degree of ownership and commitment as well. But there's other forms of money that these businesses will require to be able to become viable and in order to be able to have uh, impact on some of the poor communities and women in particular. So different sorts of grants are important and will remain important as well. In the last five years, uh, the number of farmers that are engaged in each one of the enterprises uh, has gone on average from about 1,300 to 2,400. These are farmers that are involved in the enterprise. So that's quite a, a success. And that's meant that the overall number of farmers that are directly or indirectly benefited by the program has gone to up to 30,000 almost. The percentage of women that are involved in those enterprises has increased from 20 to about 37 percent, which is also the, a lot of effort by all of our teams to work with the households and the farmers and local institutions to make sure that more of the farmers joining are women and, and trying to alleviate the barriers that women in particular face. So that's one of the successes. I have a few others. I wonder whether I'll move here and I'll just, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks. Enterprise um, sales as well have gone up. Uh, this is not, it's an estimate based on a number of numbers from different uh, spreadsheets. Don't quote me on this, but basically, enterprises have on average increased their sales by 50% a year uh, from about 30,000 to almost a bit more than 100,000 pounds after three years. One thing we'll do tomorrow is uh, talk with Kim about is that enough? to help these companies become viable, yes or no. So there's a question of sales, there's a question of profits as well that we need to look at. There's many other benefits, I believe, of the Enterprise Development Program, and this week we're talking about some of those other changes that we've seen uh, in Oxfam, from trying to do things a bit differently or trying to do more of uh, some things with some emphasis. One thing that I'd like to say is that in addition to the 17 enterprises that were approved by the board, and we've approved three to five a year, there's been a whole lot of work actually by many of you 
talking to many more enterprises to which you have been able to provide some advice and guidance as well. I counted about 140 ideas in the last five years. Ideas that Oxum, as part of a GEM program, has scrutinized the commercial viability of an enterprise there to make sure that there is enough uh, commercial substance in it to make it sustain sustainable. Even if that enterprise at the end did not pass the test, it was advised to take it somewhere further. Okay, um, how am I doing with time? Five, ten? Yeah. I have five or ten minutes, yeah? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. A key indicate. If you want more questions, then. Okay, thanks. Um, one of the key indicators that we measure, we, we measure social impact and empowerment of, of women and reducing poverty and other things, but our donors have asked again and again that we try to understand particularly whether we are building profitable businesses and actually beyond profitable businesses. Everyone knows what a profitable business is, yeah? So I don't need to explain that, it makes profits. Viable means that that profitability we, me we believe will be sustained because there's a good management team in place, there's you know, a good market and diversified clients that will continue buying from, from you, etc. After five years of supporting 19 enterprises, what we see today is that we have about four of them, that's a third to a fourth, that have become profitable and we see becoming viable. There's a group in the middle which we still have some questions Things that we need to address, like for example, will the new factory in Ethiopia uh, work? Will all the machines come together? Will the beehives come out? And will we be able to produce honey and sell it? We think yes, but there's a few things to still sort. And there's a few projects that we have not seen become viable quite yet. Projects which might become viable, not in the short term, but could maybe in the mid term, and some which might never become viable. And that's sometimes a bit controversial. For example, the case of Palestine, Mustafa can tell you a lot more. The enterprise believes next year they'll be profitable. The boat failed, it would take them two years or three, and therefore it went into the bread category. We've had lots of discussions with Mustafa, is it fair, is it not? Well, let, let's explore those things this week. But there's certainly some way to go still. Some of the failed enterprises are not failed livelihoods programs. In Liberia, for example, farmers double the, their yields. They have a lot more food to eat. Not enough food, or rice in this case, to sell and to make a profit of it. But there was a beautiful livelihoods program where food security has been improved. There's no yet an enterprise in place. So if we are today in now, which is the shape of an F, with you know, a few that are green and a few that are in the middle, our target is to get to a T where there's lots of enterprises that are in the green and very few, if possible, that are not green but might be able to make it. Is that graph helpful? I came up with it last night, so I hope it helps. <laughs> the dream is the ice cream. <laughs> where you have a lot of green at the top and then the cream at the top. I have a little boy, some of you know, and um, he's had only his third ice cream yesterday. And that's what happened to the ice cream. It just <laughs> fell down. <laughs> he was so sad about it. That's a nightmare situation. We won't be there, but you know, it could be that many of the enterprises are not viable, and then what? What have we done in Oxfam in the last five years to learn how to get here or at least here, and avoid this. We've put together, based on all the conversations you've had with the enterprises, that we've had with you, the investment committee, the board, we've, we've come up with a list of things, 17, too many, I know, but 17 things that we think are essential to support businesses that will become viable. And on Wednesday, we will be talking to the board, uh, many of you in EDP, and we will be discussing these with them so that we can exchange perspectives, uh, board people and, and your own ideas of which ones of these factors are really the essential ones. And I'll go through them in a bit. Um, things like, do you have a, a good leader, manager in place? Do you have the right market, a strategy, et cetera, et cetera. 
the first ones are about getting the right market, the right product. I won't go into too much detail on this, but one thing I want to say is that careful projections are very important. One thing we've learned is that if the success of sales has been to go up this way, you know, enterprise sales have gone from 30 to 100,000 pounds, all of you told us that we would get times 10 in three years. Some of you told us you would get to a $1 million business in two or three years. That hasn't quite happened. And sometimes that's a pity because, <laughs> because then this hasn't been looked at as a success and because we've been benchmarked against this. But it has implications as well in how we support these enterprises, which will need our support for, le for longer. The issue of leadership and management in the enterprise is essential. I think that's one thing we've learned. Okay, we know that some of these enterprises are quite remote and they don't have the capacity, but if there's not enough passion and commitment, some people that really want to see this happen, it won't happen. There's a few countries, and I won't give names now, but during the gallery you can ask, where the key person that wants to make this business success is an awesome staff. He or she is the enterprise leader, actually. Is that a good way to do it, or is it not? I mean, I, I don't know. These, these things are important, some of the reflections we've had. We've learned other lessons as well about uh, trying to test different things. Um, particularly if we introduce new products, new crops, we have to make sure that they will go, they will work. Um, the case of uh, Moringa, for example, it's a fantastic program. It took us a while to really find the right production method. In many cases, we've brought machines from all over the world, and when we've brought them together, then realize that they don't plug to each other. We're a bit amateurish sometimes as Oxfam in the project management of the processing equipment and, and, and all the technical aspect, uh, aspects. It, we, we can't uh, afford to, to do that. And a lot of the climate and non-climate related risks have also been a, an important factor uh, we've seen in Haiti, for example, the enterprise uh, being destroyed by the earthquake and other enterprises uh, suffering from long-term climate or, or, or particular patterns uh, that year. There's an effort to make by Oxum to analyze and understand those better. Do I have another five minutes? How am I doing? Yeah, I do. No, okay, I just two or three. three or three. Okay, cool. Other factors that we believe are important are to do with the different set of um, institutions that will help the enterprise. I'll go into that a bit later, but probably at the beginning we thought that Oxfam would help with mentors and local NGOs and banks to make the enterprise wheel go round and round. Probably we've now realized, and that's probably a challenge to you know, some of our thinking, that actually the Oxfam wheel has to probably sometimes be a bit bigger. We need to have a bit more capacity to really push the other wheels as well. And in the enterprise development program, it doesn't necessarily play for the others, but the NGO traditional partners we have might not have a direct role in supporting the business. Their role might be more on supporting the farmers, and that might get in the way of creating a viable business because that's not in their ethos on their experience. We've learned lots of lessons as well about how to promote uh, women-focused businesses. And Having been involved in the women's economic leadership from the beginning, I think one lesson I take is that we created in all of the enterprises opportunities for women that were the one, the opportunity that had the highest margin. Sometimes those have been the opportunities that had the highest risk for the women as well. Because we put them on something new that was not tested, where they were always going to make a lot of money if it works. And when it hasn't worked, Luckily, we had sometimes other ways of supporting those same women through other methodologies as well. One thing we've done in the Enterprise Development Program, I'll have to go quick on this now, is that if you imagine the success factors, the 17 or 19 of them, if you have them all, you're, you're green. But if you have none of them, you're red. What we've done is actually selected enterprises and supported them as close as possible to the green. Selecting enterprises that have a higher chance and supporting them to, the, to get them get there as soon as possible. The truth is that Oxfam's program probably looks a bit like this. Most of the enterprises that Oxfam supports are still lots of things not in place. 
And the enterprises that are easier for EDP to invest in are hopefully the ones that are, are up here. So how do you actually use Oxfam's program to select enterprises that Oxfam can use to invest in and prove a model of investment? That's, that's the EDP model, yeah? I mean, if we prove to the world how difficult it is and how crap we are, we're not proving anything, you know? We, we need to prove to the world that it is possible to support businesses and make them viable. And that's why the, the pilot has to emphasize the, the enterprises of the rural tough context, but the ones that have a chance to make it. What we've done is cut the cake like this. Basically, year after year, we try to understand better which ones are the enterprises that can make uh, our portfolio performance look. Do these graphs make any sense? They made a lot of sense to me. Do they make sense to you? Okay. But we're doing more than that. Yeah. We know better how to, with these success factors and your experience, to push enterprises up. And we know when some enterprises actually will not be able to make it and need, Oxfam shouldn't be working with them. And hopefully, even though the Enterprise Development Program worked with a few enterprises that you might consider the select group within Oxfam, a lot of the lessons are being used to lift uh, and encourage and inspire other, other program work outside EDP as well. That's all actually with the ice cream I'll leave you. And um, look forward to the conversations this week. Uh, the teams in EDP will go into the details of some of these themes. And um, you have a chance to talk to each of the countries individually asking their questions. Uh, but you might have questions for Thomas and I before we give you a few tips on a few other things happening this week. Thanks.